Hey, Janine, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you're here. I am so happy to be here, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, why don't we start off, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what it is that you do. Yeah, so I am Janine Staples. Hello, everyone. I am the founder of the Supreme Love Project. SLP is an emotional justice initiative for women and girls all over the world. We focus mainly in the U.S., but we have members all over the world in 40 different countries um, who come looking for solutions to interior life breakdown. And that means uh, when you come into a space in your womanhood where you know you've been a people pleaser, an approval addict, you've given power away, you've played small, you've been hiding out, and some of your exterior life evidence shows that you've not been in leadership in your life and in your love story. So your relationships are in breakdown, your self-esteem might be struggling a little bit, um, uh, even though you might be as a woman performing at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, some of those interior life secrets seep out. So uh, the Supreme Love Project is a place where women can come to get methods, strategies, coaching, systems, accountability, and community to support um, a stronger interior constitution and reclaim her power. Awesome. I love it. So how did you get into all of this? I got into it because of my own breakdown. I am um, multiple breakdowns. So I am a scholar. Um, so I am a tenured full professor um, at a global impact research one university on the East Coast in the US. Um, and that's very significant because out of, I don't know, tens and tens of thousands of professors in the United States, something like 2% are black people and 1% are black women who wow. reach the level of tenure and full promotion that I have retained. Mm -hmm. um, and I did it at a relatively young age. So I've been striving um, and succeeding at very high levels for a very long time. I was performing a lot of perfection, performing a lot of <laughs> happiness, <laughs> wellness, uh, strength and solidity, even though on the inside I was feeling um, pretty fragile and vulnerable and susceptible mm -hmm. to a lot of people's opinions and preferences and um, whims. And so, um, you know, we know of quantum law that there needs to be integrity. There needs to be an alignment of integrity so that what you're thinking, speaking, and believing and behaving actually line up. If there's a breakdown anywhere, um, there's a breakdown everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so eventually I came crashing down with, um, just emotional dress, uh, renal fatigue, um, just emotional, physical, spiritual um, breakdown. And I realized that I was a codependent. I was attracting narcissists. Um, I experienced a lot of death in my family. Um, in the space of about four years, I think we buried like 12 people. Wow. And it was an incredible, yeah, space of um, pressure and intensity in a very tight timeline mm -hmm. that just amplifies the stress and the anxiety. And when that amplification happens, Rachel, what I know about women is we're sort of binary to the extent that we'll either figure out like amazing, amazing resources and breakthroughs and we'll just keep barreling through or we'll completely disassemble. Mm -hmm. So it typically isn't like a middle ground. And I figured out a lot of things for a long time and then I broke. And I came crashing down. And so I've done research with other women who are high achieving in lots of ways, yeah. um, who are big caregivers, um, who are seen in their family, in their community, in their religious, social, sort of uh, community as leaders, as exemplars, um, but then don't take care of themselves, put themselves last on the list, um, and look for that external approval. So I, I work with a lot of women who are just like me. Um, so it's my research that brought me to the work that I do and also my personal experience that brought me to the work that I do. Wow. So if we're not taking care of ourselves and, you know, not showing up there, how does that affect the other areas of our lives? There's no way to actually achieve the a kind of, like I call it a trilogy for me, it's joy, peace, and power. There's no way to achieve a balance of joy, just like uncontainable, unbridled, like joy, not happiness, which is based on happenstance. I'm talking about an ab abiding sense of joy. It's like fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, it's not dependent on anything material. There's no way to create it and maintain it without caring for yourself. Hmm. There's just not. Hmm. Okay. So I know I really wanted to talk to you today about racism and what leaders can do to really 
participate in this discussion, but also create lasting change. So what can we do as leaders? So, you know, someone who has a business, right? Like if you're a business owner, you're a leader. Um, what can we do to participate in these discussions? So one of the things that I would encourage white people to do specifically is to educate, 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 to really do immersion in content mm -hmm. that is outside of any sort of norm um, for her or him or them. And that means really surrounding yourself and immersing yourself with um, the voices of leaders who don't look like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means reading blogs, listening to podcasts, picking up magazines, um, gravitating towards books. I just founded a great summer book club. It's a three month book club for um, anti-racist leaders or people who would like to be anti-racist leaders. So it's about doing immersion, Rachel, mm -hmm. um, really moving out of your comfort zone and also um, checking in and doing an inventory uh, around the arrogance that can come with doing the work. Mm -hmm. There are some white people who, for example, have been doing the work since before George Floyd and before Black Lives Matter and um, may be married to people of color, may have children that are um, of color, may um, uh, have friends, you know, who are people of color and may say, oh, well, I'm, I've arrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a really clear understanding because of these affiliations. Yeah. And the truth is you cannot and you do not have the type of arrival <laughs> that you may imagine you have because you're not in the experience in the same way um, that the people who are you're affiliated with are in. It's just it's like a man saying, well, I'm married to a woman, so I live with her. I know yeah. all about women. I know all about womanhood. No, you really don't. Yeah. <laughs> you don't. Um, and so it's about doing immersion and then checking entitlement and arrogance. I think that's such an important point. For me especially, I'm married to a Black man from West Africa. I'm raising biracial children. And a lot of what has been happening in the world has been like, a, a huge wake up call to me because I, it's, it's opened up conversations with my husband of like, what have you experienced? Cause it's not something he's for him. It's like normal life, right? Like he experiences racism, racism on a often. Right. And for him, it's like, it's nothing new. And for me, I've been like, wow. So you, people ignore you in our neighborhood. We live in a neighborhood that's like 95, 98% white. He's like, yeah, I'll say hi to people and people completely ignore me. And I never even realized that. And it's really opened up those conversations for we to, for us to have together as a couple. And then for me to be like, wow, I'm, I'm still very ignorant, even though I am married to a black man raising biracial children. I still have so much work to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of space to grow and learn. One of the things I teach in the Supreme Love Project, particularly in Break the Chains Book Club, which is specifically designated for anti-racist leadership, is that um, actually a big sort of, it's not a drawback, but it's a hindrance. This notion that we, um, it's important to put ourselves in someone else's shoes as a method for growing our empathetic core, that actually doesn't work as well as one might think that it would work. A lot of scholars um, in my area in race and gender theory, we fight about this at conferences and I'm saying, stop telling people to try to put themselves in other people's shoes. That is not logical or sustainable as a method to grow in awareness. Mm -hmm. It actually is more enriching and um, um, organically like moving to just ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. to ask a lot of questions and sort of interview people who are available for that. There are lots of black people and brown people who are not available to be interviewed yep. and who are not interested in that. But people who are, you're in an allyship relationship with already, like your husband, for example, um, not taking anything for granted and asking him, like, tell me about your day, like describe your day for me. And also knowing that if you do ask such questions, remember also that the average black person will forget to tell you about the times that they're discriminated against because they are so normalized. Yep. Um, and so there will be details that are left out. So in addition to interviewing and asking questions, opening your eyes and taking for granted, this might be a very pessimistic view, Rachel, but mm -hmm. taking for granted that white supremacy is embedded into the fabric of every institution and every social circle of the United States of America. If you take that for granted and you say to yourself, where is white supremacy? Mm -hmm. Instead of, is there white supremacy? The answer to that is already yes. So if you shift the question for your observational lenses and just say, where is it? 
Let me look for it. Where is white supremacy? Where is it in my children's school? Where is it in my children's curriculum? Where is it in my husband's experience? Where is it in my experience? Like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? If you start asking the question and donning like an investigative lens, you basically wake yourself up out of the stupor Mm -hmm. that white supremacy depends on. White supremacy depends on white people being sort of unconscious and sleepy and walking through their lives sort of like half conscious. So we ask the question, we find it, what can we then do? So one of the things you do is when you find white supremacist patriarchal ideology in curriculum or in social practice or in policy or in um, just community culture, what you can do is just figure out how to nail it down and challenge it. So I, as a scholar, am very systematic. So I believe in journaling and I think it's a really good idea to write things down. White supremacy is, and white privilege and white fragility are so prevalent, they're ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Meaning that once you find one point of it, you can take for granted it's a tip of an iceberg and there's a lot of tentacles behind it. So write it down. So if you say to yourself, huh, I noticed that in my son's um, classroom, there are like no books that represent people of color. Mm -hmm. Um, And that there are lots of books that talk about Um, diversity um, that feature animals and cars and buildings that talk and not people. That's actually a field of research, like children's literature. Um, And so if you say, oh, I noticed this, there's some white supremacy there. That's that's basically creating the, um, the idea that whiteness is so superior that it's normalized and anything else is exceptional or special or unique or, you know, odd that we've got to study. So, okay, I'm going to write that down in my journal and say, here's where I found white supremacy in my kid's school, in their curriculum. Let that be a part of a justice project for you. Like, how do I feel about it? You can ask yourself some questions. How do I feel about that? How do I feel about what it will do to my child's psyche? How do I feel about what it, what it says about my teachers, my child's teacher's psyche? How do I feel about what it might do um, to the psyche of my child's white friends. Like what are the ramifications of just this one point of the presence of white supremacy? Really dig in, Mm -hmm. dig into it. Generate an energy around it and and think about the long-term effect of that one point of a white supremacist patriarchal ideology and then set up a justice project there. (laughs) Like research some more books, um, contact some authors, get a round table or a panel together, write a letter to the school, write a letter to the teacher, you know, really become an advocate in that one area um, on behalf of your child and your community. And that act, Rachel, of just con- creating a constructive project around that one point will generate other projects. That's mm-hmm. how it works. It's a domino effect. Hmm. That's something that I've definitely noticed and try to be more aware of is like the books that I'm buying for my son. Since he is biracial, I want to make sure that we're buying a mixture of, you know, like where you, you know what I mean? Um, but do you have any authors that you would recommend for us to look? Cause it's something you actually have to seek out of finding like the black hero in a book, right? Like a children's yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. I don't offhand because young adult literature is not my area, but I have colleagues in the area and I can get a list. That would be amazing. Share a list with you and your community. Um, like I can do it tomorrow. (laughs) That would be amazing. We'll make sure to put it in the show notes. Um, so everyone can check that out. Um, so one of my students, she's a, a black female and I was coaching her. And one of the questions she had for me was, who can I see as a role model who looks like me? Because in my business, it's either white men or white women who are successful. So who could I look to? So do you have any people who are like crushing podcasts or just doing a really great job in business that you would suggest that we could, because one of the things that you said is like immerse yourself, learn from these people. So who is somebody that we can learn from? Me. So (laughs) I I am a multi-six on my way, a seven figure coach. And so, yeah, and I have um, built the Supreme Love Project from scratch and we've been in operation for five years. I am um, a professor. In addition to running SLP, I am able to coach and teach women of color what it looks like to be in a white man and a white woman's world in doing the work. There are very few other people, to be honest, Rachel. Um, I am a part of a network of, of coaches uh, who are um, doing really um, powerful work. 
Um, the very few who are doing it at the caliber and the level I am, I can think of two other women besides me that I would name. Wow. All right. So definitely be sending people to you. Um, what can we as white people expect to happen when we start to participate in these discussions? And, you know, maybe there's like a breakdown in communication. So like, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Louis Giglio. Um, he's a pastor oh, yeah, yeah. at Passion yeah. Church in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so he brought on Lecrae to have like a discussion about racism. And he said something that wasn't the right thing to say. Um, and he got a lot of backlash and hate for, in his defense, he was trying to have an open conversation about racism, but just like the wrong words came out of his mouth. So how, wh what can we do to make sure we're having discussions about this, but we're not afraid to say the wrong thing. And if we do say the wrong thing to keep standing back up and to keep putting ourselves forward, to keep having these discussions. What did he say? Um, that slavery was a blessing and oh, it came that. out the wrong, like it was the wrong thing to say. And it, in his head, it made sense, but the way that he said it really did not sound right. Well, the problem is it's not about it sounding right. It's, it's wrong. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually a revelation of the corruption in his own soul. Yep. And that I'm sure is embarrassing for him that he revealed that that is his ideological frame, that slavery somehow was a blessing. I wonder if he would have said the same thing if his ancestors were raped and tortured mm -hmm. and um, kidnapped and brutalized and decimated for generations mm. um and so it's not about saying the wrong thing it's really about being intoxicated by a white supremacist patriarchal ideology that would lead a person to create that logic mm -hmm. um, it's the logic that he operates from and it makes him very dangerous it makes him incredibly dangerous and just not trustworthy as a leader and that's humiliating for him, I'm sure. It's embarrassing for him, but yet it's a reality that is important. I, as a person, as a black woman, I would never go to his church. <laughs> I would not, because if that is the way that he thinks, I cannot trust the other ideologies that he might be teaching right. um, and adding a pet theology from scriptural interpretation. So I think what the thing to do is for white people to take for granted and understand that there is and automatic corruption. And it's not just for white people. People of color, black people are corrupted by white supremacy too, all in different ways. We've all been um, indoctrinated with these ideas around superiority and inferiority. What's in endemic in his logic is that black people must be inferior um, in order for them to be enslaved, kidnapped and enslaved. And it must be a part of their destiny somehow to have been, um, tortured and kidnapped by white people, which in effect makes white people superior. And that is an embedded infrastructure of the logic. And he might not be aware of it. And yet it is the logic he's operating from. Mm -hmm. So what would be important is to know that to some extent, we're all corrupted by a series of logics that white supremacy um, and patriarchy and toxic masculinity uh, put in place to maintain a status quo. And if we take for granted that we're all corrupted, it doesn't matter what your spiritual affiliation is. It doesn't matter that you're a pastor. It makes no difference. It doesn't matter if you're married to a black person. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter if you have black children. It makes really no difference. It doesn't matter if you've gone on about a thousand mission trips. That actually can be worse. Um, because it can exacerbate this idea that people of color are inferior and need to be saved in a different way than white people, which is ludicrous. And yet it's, it's nurtured. That idea is nurtured. So if we take for granted that we've been affected and our question is, how have I been affected? So again, the question is not, have I been affected? It's how have I been affected? We take for granted that yes, I've been affected. How have I been affected? How are my logics corrupted? How am I operating from a superiority inferiority complex? Mm -hmm. In what ways am I perpetuating that complex, even among the people that I like, love and respect? And then how can I interrupt that? How can I actually transform and shift? Um, and that's gonna come with anxiety. It's gonna come with embarrassment. It's gonna come with stress. And guess what? 
um, dealing with those kinds of subterranean energies is a part of what will help white people to actually grow stamina and grow strength and grow capacity um, to manage discomfort. Black and brown people have graduated an incredible level of stamina and strength and capacity because of the ways that we have been inundated by white supremacy and by microaggressions and systemic aggressions um, by the state. And so it's time, I think, for white people to develop the same capacity, mm -hmm. the same strength, and the st same stamina. Being coddled and being pacified won't get anyone anywhere. Um, and, you know, there's so much, so much to look forward to in graduating your consciousness to be stronger and to be um, more empowered um, to take criticism and to take critique mm -hmm. and to actually grow your muscle um, to stay in the fight. For sure. I forget who said this, so I don't want to say the wrong name, but they said that, you know, racism is something that white people created. Um, so it's white people that have to fight yeah. to end it. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. You do. Okay. I do. Mm -hmm. I can say more about that. I feel like. Yes, um, I do. I want you to say more about it. Yeah. So. If we trace back the history, most people in the United States of America, very few people and citizens in the United States of America know the history of how the country actually was founded, like how we actually came to be. Um, white imperialist, colon um, colonialist ideas actually forged like the crafting of the nation with the idea that whiteness was superior, white men were super superior, and that there need to be an, needed to be an order and a status quo put in place to maintain that superiority. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's etched into the fabric. It's a ubiquitous ideology. And racism was created by white people in order to maintain social, economic, um, ideological, like the performance of superior, superiority. And white people and other people of color, indigenous um, folks especially, have needed to um, understand very specifically that racism was constructed and built to maintain a status quo and then create these adaptive skills to live in the context and still obtain some modicum of success and have some modicum of um, peace um, and safety. And so the admission of white people um, to taking responsibility for that creation is absolutely, it's integral. We won't, we won't make progress. So a lot of people ask me, you know, oh, Janine, this is the American spring. So are we at a tipping point where we can now look to a new future and expect all these great things? And my, my, my response is probably not. And it is very pessimistic on my part, and yet it's realistic. It's because what we know is it would take a really deeply powerful critical mass of white people, hmm. a huge critical mass of white people, because black and brown people make up about 13% of the population of the United States of America. So white people still, even though there will be a big um, shift in the next 40 years, right now, white people still make up like 87% of the population of the United States of America. There would need to be a critical mass, a much larger mm -hmm. critical mass of white people who agree, who understand and appreciate and agree mm -hmm. with the fact that racism was created by white people and then make a commitment to undoing that system of oppressions. And the reason that that will take so long and it may not come is because the admission of that, Rachel, would necessitate a disassembly of the current privilege and power structure in the United States, hmm. where there would need to be a redistribution of wealth, there would need to be a redistribution of authority, there would need to be a deference to um, voices that have been historically marginalized, and that takes a level of humility and um, grace and self-awareness that the average white person does not have yet. Hmm. Not yet. Yeah. 
What would you say to somebody when they're speaking about the Black Lives Matter movement and they say all lives matter? Because this is something that I've seen a lot on social media. You know, I might share a post and then I see my sister-in-law, she shares it, bless her heart. And then one of her friends comments on it. No, all lives matter. And it's a white person that's making that comment. So what, what would you say to somebody that says that? I would agree with the common response that a lot of black scholars have made. It's just to help white people to understand um, really the, 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 the monumentous moment that we're in. Of course, when we care about all human lives, all lives matter in a general sense. Mm -hmm. What Black Lives Matter is saying is that all lives can't matter unless Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And we know that by the status quo's um, abuse of black lives, that black lives do not matter the same way that white lives matter. Black lives are not protected and are not valued the same way that white lives are mattered. And so the call and the cry for black lives matter is really about paying attention to the folks who are in the biggest crisis right now. Hmm. And that's the same thing that we do with any social justice movement. So during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, when there is a huge amount of research that shows how um, women are disproportionately affected by breast cancer and how serious it is, how it takes the lives of women, how it cripples families financially, emotionally, socially. You know, no one says all cancers matter. You know, it would be defeating the purpose. The point is we're focusing on breast cancer right now. Right. <laughs> because women who have breast cancer are dying at a much higher rate than any other people who have cancer right now. And that those are the people that we need to work with and we need to support and we need to understand their experience much better. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I would say is just get your head in the game. Um, and also recognize the level of entitlement and arrogance and fragility and insecurity that comes from the All Lives Matter statement. Mm -hmm. um, a person who is so accustomed to be as being central in every conversation, whether it's explicit or implicit, is the person calling all lives matter. That's the person who is so entitled and who is so blinded by their own centrality that they feel perplexed and stressed and anxious that any other group of people who are um, really being um, placed in positions of terror um, would be centralized. And so checking entitlement, checking fragility um, is a part of the conversation for All Eyes Matter people too. Hmm. I like the comparison to Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, I think yeah. that's, that's awesome. So we're leaders as business owners. As leaders, how can we create a community that's really committed to doing the work and to doing justice? So I think that the way to create a community is to create containers and spaces that are an integ integral part of your company. So there are a couple of people right now who are doing ad hoc um, events. They're saying, oh, let's have this um, webinar or let's have this round table. Let's invite a couple of people in to talk about this issue. And it's a flash in the pan um, for what really gets to be a lifelong investment in your own self and in your own education. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out a way to create an arm or a branch or an entity in your company that's committed to this inquiry, this research, this activism, so that it's just a natural, normal, typical part of your work is what is the requirement. How does love play a role in justice work? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. So um, we are the Supreme Law Project and what my focus is um, uh, tends to organize energy around noticing how love can be critical, how love can be conscious, um, how love can be um, justice oriented. And so one of the surefire ways to make anything last is to infuse it with love because love is such a sustainable life force. And so if you're interested in being a leader that is anti-racist and anti-misogynistic, anti-phobic, and that's a commitment, one of the big imperatives would be for you to figure out where is your love affair in the movement? Hmm. Where are you in love with the cause? 
Where are you in love with the people who are the benefits of the cause? Where is your love? Where are the limits of that love? Where is the passion, the intimacy, the connectedness? Um, if you are operating in your leadership as a rote knee-jerk reaction to just be a part of the moment mm -hmm. or to be popular or to be on the cutting edge of what's hot right now, you will quickly lose steam because it's hard. The work is hard. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's just like anything worth having. It's hard. And so love is a part of justice work because it's fuel for justice work find your love affair with the justice project that you are interested in and then it will last that was going to be one of my questions is like this is a hot topic or it was i don't know if it still is because it's been like a couple months right so how do we make sure that this is something that is la like a lasting conversation because like you said it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of people for things to actually start to change so how do we keep this an ongoing conversation and ongoing work yeah it's just to find the love that's my answer <laughs> find the love find what you love about the movement find who you love in the movement um get it connected to a vision for what um could be the effects of the movement like what could this movement do for um, people 10 years from now? How can it create a change in the world? Fall in love with that vision. Mm -hmm. You know, get emotionally, energetically, spiritually attuned to that result, um, to that shift, uh, to the moments that actually are liberatory, that are emancipatory. Get connected, fall in love. That's how it lasts. Mm -hmm. For people that might be feeling overwhelmed with everything, what's just a way that they can get started and then continue with their education? So I would say, you know, take a look at the New York Times bestsellers lists right now for the nonfiction books. Most of them have to do with anti-racist leadership. Just take one at a time. You know, read one book, um, get a circle of friends who are connected to reading that book and go down the list. Um, and journal about it, blog about it, have conversations about it, figure out your justice project one book at a time. What's one of the best books you've read? Right now um, in my book club, um, we're reading Push Out. Oh, actually, well, this is a podcast night. Nobody can see me, right? No, they so, can. we'll put it on YouTube so people can see. Okay, so I want to show you this book. Yes. Um, so this is a book we're reading right now. It's called Push Out by Monique Morris. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how black girls are treated in schools and society. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really powerful read. It's based on many years of qualitative data around the experiences of girls in school. It's the criminalization of black girls in schools. And it's, it's an incredibly powerful book. One of, one of the things we notice about the Black Lives Matter movement, as a scholar, I notice this, is that it, we focus a lot on boys and men in Black Lives Matter, which is fine, which is good. Um, but Black girls experience a great deal of state violence as well. So educating yourself about the experience of girls is huge. Okay. I have another question that's maybe a little bit more personal. So I want to talk about cultural appropriation. What's right for white people to do? What's wrong? So I saw a video on braids and like the history of braids. And in the video, it said um, like white people wearing braids was, it wasn't like the right thing to do. However, when I was living in Africa, I lived in Kenya and in Senegal. And when I was in Senegal, people were really excited to share their culture with me. So they wanted me to dress like them. They wanted to braid my hair. Um, so where's, what's the right thing to do? And what's offensive? So one of the things that's really important to notice and remember is context. Mm -hmm. So people who are African on the continent of Africa do not have the same experience as African-American people. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a descendant of enslaved people and African people who come here are not descendants. They don't have the same experience. And you being a white person on the continent of Africa are um, essentially in a context wherein you are um, not a member of the majority, uh, you could be seen as a student to be taught something, um, that something gets to be shared with you in a particular context. That's a contextual experience. Mm -hmm. In the United States of America, it's a completely different context. We have a completely different history. We have a completely different culture. There's completely different norms and values. Mm -hmm. And so just the same way it's not appropriate for white women, for example, to touch black women's hair or to touch black women's skin, I say that it is not appropriate for white women to co-opt black women's styles 
um, without clear understanding of what's happening when that cooptation happens. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just another way of educating oneself as a white woman um, to basically the ramifications, the implications mm -hmm. of um, those moves. So for example, there are white women who, um, you know, plump their lips to um, be full, like the lips of the average black woman, or wear their hair in braids, um, or get injections in their behind to make themselves look a particular way. It's actually contort their body or tan to the point of brownness mm -hmm. um, in a way to perform an identity. And it, what, what ends up happening, Rachel, is if a woman is um, so unconscious that she is not asking herself questions about the moves she's making, mm -hmm. like, how am I positioned in the world as a white woman? How am I put on a pedestal and given lots of rights that I didn't earn or necessarily ask for, but that are just given to me by virtue of my birth? Um, and what do those mean? What, what, do, what do my, um, my giftings mean? And how can they be weaponized? Like, how can my whiteness actually be weaponized to actually denigrate or dismiss or depreciate the value of Black girls and women? Like, if there's going to be solidarity between women, there must be acknowledgement of experience. Um, and there also must be a really clear understanding for white women around this, this idea of entitlement mm -hmm. and property. So there's something in white consciousness and I'm talking about white consciousness literally as a consciousness, not white people. I'm talking about like white consciousness, the way that white people are taught to think about ownership is that everything belongs to me. Mm -hmm. All words, all hairstyles, all clothes, all continents, all love, all, everything belongs to me. It's all mine. And I can do whatever I want with anything. And that type of entitlement has consequences. Mm -hmm. It can depreciate relationships between white women and black women. That's why there's a great lack of trust. Um, there's a great lack of respect. Um, there's often a great lack of intimacy. There's a great lack of knowledge because of that lack of interrogation. So I would say, and I hear you saying, Rachel, like what's right and what's wrong, like wanting to be on a side. Right. And that's, that's an impulse that we have just to feel safe. So what I would encourage you to say is instead of right and wrong, ask yourself, what is helpful in this moment? What's mm -hmm. supportive in this moment? What's mm -hmm. respectful in this moment? Mm -hmm. And if you ask those questions as opposed to right, wrong, you can take away some of the rigidity and the fear yeah. that comes in the binary of right, wrong, and just start asking a little bit different questions. Like, what is respectful to my Black sisters? Do I think Black women are sisters? Like, what is honoring to Black women? Where, where do I feel entitled? Um, how, how would this move that I make actually affect another person? Um, and how do I educate myself on the experience of black women in schools and in society? Like, where am I actually being present to experience? And then let me make my decision. I think if a lot of women, um, especially women who are leaders, who take full responsibility and who are interested in um, being sensitive, being thoughtful, um, you know, really being smart about how they adorn themselves and how they participate in social circles and cultural norms and values and co-collaborate, co mm -hmm. we'll find that their responses will be, well, I really appreciate and I love that style. And right now it wouldn't be respectful for me to take it up. Mm -hmm. And that's enough. Got it. What does it mean to you to make an impact? Wow. Um, well, uh, it means stretching myself uh, to think about a ripple effect. I think about impact as like the boom and then the ripple. So I find that some people think about the boom, like which is the big splash. Like how can I make a big boom and a splash to be to make an impact? And I understand the splash, but I am thinking about the ripple effect of my impact. So I ask myself like, will this thing, this initiative that I create, make a stand and like create a moment? The next question that I ask for my impact factor is, how will my impact be felt 10 years from now? How might it be effective 10 years from now? Will it be effective? Will anyone remember this move that I'm making? Um, how can it be an intergenerational effect? And that's what impact means to me. It means thinking short and long-term. I love it. Where can we connect with you? Um, so people can go to the Supreme Love Project.com. I can also, for show notes, leave you a free gift if people would like to 
um, get some of our great stuff. We've got lots of great anti-racist um, gifts that we can provide to the community so that they can learn more about all kinds of things. Anti-racist leadership, white supremacy, um, what to look out for and how to be aware. That would be amazing. Thank you so much um, for, for being on the show, for sharing everything. I've learned a lot, so I really appreciate you and your time. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate this invitation. It was great to connect with you.